Breaking news, the American Kennel Club recently revealed their annual list of the most popular dog breeds. You'll never guess which breed made it to the top for the 31st time in a row. That's right, the forever lovable Lab. My fans have been asking me for this for a while. Michelle, tell me more about my dog's breed. I got you started with this video here all about dog breeds, which goes over the different classes of which breed belongs where. But you asked for more information, so today, finally, I'm gonna give it to you. In today's video, we're gonna do a deep dive into dream dogs, and labs are first on my list. Michelle here with How to Train a Dream Dog. And if you're excited about this new series and you're anxious for more breeds to be covered, you should definitely subscribe to the channel so you're going to get notified when new videos become available. All right, let's talk about labs. Now, I've been a trainer for more than 20 years and I've had a lot of labs as part of my caseload. That doesn't mean labs are any more difficult to train for the average owner. It just means that these owners felt like they needed a little more expertise. I do have a soft spot for labs because it was a lab named Bear that got me started as a professional dog trainer. Now, when I was younger, before I was a trainer, I bought a lab from a breeder. I did not do any research into what it took to own and adequately train a dog to live in my human world. So let's just say that Bear and I had a rough few months. He <laughs> ate two couches, shredded the curtains off the wall, dug a giant hole in the yard and ripped up the carpet to pieces. He chewed through several paint cans in the garage, making a massive mess. And it was red paint, so you can imagine my first thought when I came home. It literally looked like a crime scene. Bear cost me a mint in the vet bills too when he tore his ACL jumping off the back step and tore his toe off simply by running and chasing. And if you have any labs, you know all about the shedding. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Bear had so much hair, he absolutely loved to swim, so there was a lot of grooming and bathing and drying off in our life together. So as you saw from that breed video I mentioned, labs belong to the sporting group, which includes spaniels, like pickles and other retrievers, like peach. Hunters have historically used sporting dogs to gather game both on land and in the water. That's an important distinction from the hound group of dogs who track game on land that hasn't been killed or shot yet. Sporting dogs are considered highly trainable, and because of this, they're often selected to train for work as service dogs. Now, their easygoing nature also makes them a really good fit for families with children. Now, I always wanna caution people, though, that just because the breed is often very easygoing and has a history of working well with kids, that doesn't mean it's a free-for-all for the kids. There will always be boundaries that kids should have with dogs, regardless of their breed. Now, you can learn more about that in this video. Now, if you have kids and dogs, this is a must to watch. Labs are true to their name, retrievers. So one of their favorite activities is usually fetching something. Let's dig into that one just a little bit more. So if the lab was bred to fetch things, you can imagine that they are comfortable and happy to have something in their mouth. In fact, the labs I've worked with love to put everything in their mouth. They're very oral dogs and they love to dig and chew. So if you have a lab, or are considering one, keep in mind that they will likely be very fixated on chewing things, and you're gonna need to do a great job of puppy proofing and providing appropriate outlets for chewing. Many of my clients who were lab owners would call me because they were frustrated by all the destructive chewing. More than 75% of the lab cases I worked on included educating owners on how much dogs like to chew and need outlets for expending their energy. Labs absolutely love to sniff and explore, maybe more than other breeds, and they love to chase and retrieve. Now, it's so important for lab owners to give their dogs a chance to do all of these things that they love. This means lots of decompression walks, but also some hearty games with the flirt pole, or fetch, or even water sports too. Now, chewing might be a frustrating behavior for humans, but there are ways to make it work for you. These include giving the dog things they can chew on and making sure their canine instincts have an outlet. And as always, your dog is unique and what he loves to do may vary. This is your job as the owner. Figure out what your dog loves to do and find ways to offer that activity regularly. Now, I'm not gonna go any further into the chewing behavior today, but I do have two videos that are gonna help you with that. Now, I love this one here on canine enrichment and then watch this one 
on what to do if your puppy's just driving you crazy. Just know that if you're a lab owner, you really, really will want to understand chewing and how to deal with it. And simply trying to just suppress it isn't the right approach. Okay, so I think you heard me loud and clear. Labs love to chew, but what else are they likely to love? Survey says, water! <laughs> this is a generalization, so I want you to promise me that you'll examine your own dog's preference before making assumptions. But most labs I've met are pretty fond of water. Sometimes they come with this water-loving personality from birth based on their lineage. Other labs grow to love water. My Spaniel Pickles, another sporting group dog, recently was introduced to water for the first time. Sure, he's had baths, but I decided to try it out for fun and play. Now you can see how it went in this video here from a few weeks ago. Now I had one client that had trouble with her lab and she called me for a consultation. Her dog, Buddy, was obsessed with water. He would see a puddle and get so excited to play in it or any body of water. It was highly inconvenient to have every outing end with a wet dog, but we had to find a way to make these two worlds work together. We ended up coming up with a good schedule for Buddy where he could take a swim every day in either the kiddie pool or a nearby lake. We also increased the variety of activities from just a simple walk to include decompression walks and also in-home activities like snuffle mats, busy boxes, and even puzzle feeders. This helped keep his lab brain busy and his obsession for water diminished to a more tolerable level. Buddy needed a lot of novelty in his life to keep him content. Now, when I last spoke to the owner, they were about to get involved in some dog diving competitions. That sounds like an excellent plan for Buddy. Now, I'm not sure if he ended up being competitive enough to win anything, but I am 100% sure he had fun trying. Now, if you have a lab, who's particularly fond of water, you might benefit from some proactive training. Now you can teach him or her to have a natural pause when reaching the boundary of water. This means that if he sees a small pond, he might go running to check it out, but at the water line, he's gonna stop and wait for the release word. That means he can go in. This is what good training is designed to do. Teach your puppy what you want him to do and practice it so much that he just does it. Now it does take time and training to achieve that, but you can imagine how helpful a safety skill like that really is. Lab bodies were really designed for water sports. They have a really thick tail, which some people call an otter tail. It's used like the boat rudder while in the water. Their webbed feet help them swim more efficiently and their thick waterproof coats keep them warm even in the cold water. They come from Newfoundland, so their genetics mean they're used to those icy waters and their coat is too. All of these traits make labs great competitors in water sports, like dock diving trials, or simply as family companions on lake days. Labs often perform really well in agility, rally, and obedience activities. They have a lot of energy, and when you direct that energy toward a particular activity, they can do so well and have a ton of fun. Labs that don't receive ample exercise might end up displaying destructive behaviors, like chewing on objects around the house or escaping the yard. Now I've had many clients who say, he gets plenty of exercise, that can't be the problem. And yet when we examine the schedule and the dog's behavior, there are adjustments that need to be made. Always try to vary up the exercise and be sure to balance mental and physical work. Dogs who have too much imbalance in mental and physical work often show unwanted behaviors like chewing, digging, barking, and destroying things. The first dog of mine, Bear, he's a perfect example of that. Once I started changing up his schedule and offering a larger variety of activities, things got a lot better. Oh, and I also learned a lot about canine behavior and body language so we began to develop a common language. That's one of the biggest benefits of working through a training program with your dog. You really get to know them and learn about how they communicate too. Now, one of the other trainers on my team told me that she loves to teach labs to fetch specific items, like go get the fox or go get the lamb. This helps engage their love of retrieving along with some brain power for that mental and physical balance I was talking about. Now, I know you're loving this info on labs, but I want you to remember that breed is only one indicator of potential behavior. There are so many factors that contribute to canine behavior. Along with the other trainers on my team, we recently came up with this super interesting pie chart. Look at all the things we felt contribute to canine behavior. There's a lot. That's why it's so hard when people come to me and say, give me the one thing that will make my lab stop biting at my feet. Well, sorry, Charlie, but there are actually a lot of things that can cause your lab to bite at your feet. So there's gonna be a lot of things we need to do to work on that. 
But breathe definitely plays a role, so let's keep going on more great stuff about labs. A fellow trainer and friend, Nicole, has worked with a lot of labs in her job training service dogs. She reports that about 50% of the labs in the service dog program were great for the job, and more often even better fit than the shepherd mixes they had. So being extra mouthy and bitey were a few of the common behaviors they'd see in these labs. Now with proper training, this habit could be channeled and would only show up when the owner asked for it. And if you think about it, a service dog might have to use his mouth for a lot of things that the handler needs. So being fairly oral is not a bad thing for this job. Okay, other traits Nicole saw a lot in those labs were persistence and not being easily frustrated. They were confident and easily accepting of just about anything they encountered. Lest you think these labs were all work and no play, Nicole said that these guys were usually goofy and playful, but ready to work when the vest was on. All right, now let's talk about the owner's role in having a lab. Other than providing proper outlets for their favorite activities, it's gonna be really important to budget in some money for grooming these beasts. Labrador retrievers have short coats that is extremely dense. The good news is that you don't typically have to get out any of the tangles or mats. I've also found that you can usually stretch out your grooming appointments longer than you would be able to with some of the other breeds. So in fact, many of the owners of the labs will only bathe their dogs a few times a year. Now, although you don't have to bathe your Labrador frequently, you will want to brush them out frequently. These dogs are notorious for shedding from that double coat that provides so much of that protection. Now, unless you regularly brush out your lab's fur, with a special brush like this one, you're gonna find yourself vacuuming daily. Now as a bonus, brushing their fur more often will help spread their natural oils through their coat, lubricating their skin and providing them with a healthy looking shine. Now you might notice periods of more intense shedding. This does usually occur about twice a year during spring and autumn when the lab is almost completely shedding their coat. Now, if you don't groom him or her every other day during this time, Shed fur may become caught and trap excess oils and dead skin, leading to some irritation. And if you're having any trouble with any grooming tools and your lovable lab, check out this video here on how to prepare him or her to go to the groomer and not hate it. Now you might want to talk to your groomer about the de-shed treatments, which can be a big help with all that fur. Oh, and another thing I want to mention about labs. In the training industry, we joke that these guys are puppies for several years. What we really mean is that some of the normal puppy behavior that some people find rather frustrating is often present in labs for longer than other breeds. Now it's important to begin teaching what we kind of call impulse control at a young age, but you might find that you're teaching it to your lab a lot longer than the puppies. Team trainer Caitlin was telling me about a client she had that was looking for good meet and greet manners at the door with her dog. Now he was a big chunky lab who was going to grow to well over a hundred pounds. So you can imagine he would really knock someone over if he was just left to do whatever his excited puppy brain wanted. She actually worked with the client to teach Roger to sit when guests came over and while being greeted, and to sit when coming inside and to sit when coming out of the crate. These are all examples of manners that might take just a little more time with your sweet lab. So you're going to need a lot of patience, a good training plan, and maybe even a professional to guide you if you get stuck. Now I realized I was in over my head with Bear, so from that experience, I read and I watched everything I could about training dogs. And with time and training, Bear and I developed a great life together. And those frustrating behaviors got better the more we worked together. And thanks to Bear, I got a whole new career. Now you can thank Bear too. All right, before I wrap up today, I wanna introduce you to a few of my lab friends. After all, if we can't look at pictures of cute labs while talking about them, what's the point? These are all students enrolled in my online course, and they're working through the four modules of the course while teaching their furry friends how to live in a human world. The pro level offers more support and guidance, so we're helping with a few extra things. Probably some extra mouthy behavior, excess energy, and maybe even a dog that's always looking for water. They're all super cute, am I right? I bet you just want to take them all home. Well, you, you can't. They all have great homes already. <laughs> but you can get a lab of your own, and then you, too, can post cute pictures in my Facebook group, Puppy Training with Michelle Lennon. I hope today's video gave you a little better understanding if you have a lab, or your pup has a lab in their breed mix. I enjoyed today's video. It gave me a chance to remember my favorite lab, Bear, and share him with all of you. In the comments below, tell me if you have a lab. And if you don't, tell me which breed I should deep dive into next.